Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Wisconsin Eye coverage of the elections is continuing at the Milwaukee Public Library. Tom Palzowitz of Brookfield is a Democratic candidate in the 5th Congressional District. Tom, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Well, thanks for having me. Central issue in your campaign, number one. Uh, I would say health care. Uh, what's happening with health care today is health care is sucking up dollars from almost every other component of our economy. Um, I'm part of the Elmbrook Education Foundation. I was talking with Mark Hansen, who's the Elmbrook superintendent. And he said their percentage of health care in their school system went from 6% to 14% in a, in a period of about eight years. And what that means, and he said he spends a whole day thinking about health care, which means that health care is sucking up education dollars. Uh, in business, it's sucking up dollars that can be used for expansion. And then people in general, I mean, you know this, uh, health care went up 4.8% uh, in the last year they recorded, and wages only went up about 2.6%. So people are just falling further and further behind. What's the answer? Healthcare. Universal health care? I think we need to go to a universal health care plan, and I think there's lots of benefits for that. Um, one being we're moving to uh, uh, an environment from a, an economy standpoint where jobs are going to be much more mobile. And if we want jobs to be mobile, we can need to figure out how to decouple jobs from health care. So we need to get people covered so they can move in and out of different jobs and know that their health is protected. And it's good for companies, too, because companies are really struggling with how do we maintain and bring in good people and still cover them and still be able to make a profit. Number one issue in the U.S. House this week, though, is immigration. What's your position mm -hmm. on the immigration bill, DACA, DREAMers, et, et cetera, please? It's very frustrating because as a country, we're a country of immigrants. And this is something we continue to go back to is, you know, we go into pro-immigration, anti-immigration, pro-immigration, anti-immigration. And we need to get to the point where we just have this common sense idea that immigration is good for our country. Uh, my great-grandfather came through Ellis Island, and you pronounced my name, and I'm hoping that's the way it's pronounced in Poland, but we really don't know for sure. Uh, but all he had to really do was sign on the dotted line and come into the country. Um, as a country, we get growth in a couple of different ways. Our economy is driven by 70% consumer spending, and consumer spending is driven by wage growth, and it's driven by the number of consumers. And I don't know if you've seen the population trends in the United States lately, but we're not making as many babies. So new people are going to be coming from immigration, which is going to drive the economy. And then we also need wage growth to drive the economy. So, so immigration needs to be, we need some kind of plan that says, look, we need to make it easier to get in because there's lots of jobs to be had. And then we need to make it in a way that, all right, if you're here, here are the steps that you have to go through to become a citizen. When a family crosses the border into America illegally, a family, a parent mm -hmm. and a child. Mm -hmm. What should happen to that? Well, that family should stay together no matter what. Um, you know, as I understand, you know, asking to be granted asylum in this country is not a crime. You know, and, and to treat it as a crime and to be ripping these families apart is, is not only wrong, it's inhumane. And I think part of what's going on right now is we have policies that people are pointing to as inhumane, but those policies are driven by people. And we, the people, have a right to understand what are the policies that we want to have that really are part of our core values as Americans. And it's part of the reason I'm running. We're going down this path where I think we're, we're not treating the people, people the way we need to treat them. And I think it's, it's a common problem across a whole bunch of different sectors. The number two issue in Washington right now is tariffs. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts on the tariffs that the uh, Trump administration has ordered? Tariffs are very frustrating to me. You know, I understand that we want to have free and fair trade. I think it's really important. And, you know, and, and countries have used tariffs in order to, to move the needle on certain industries in one way, shape, or form. I think there needs to be a comprehensive game plan, and there already is a way to be able to negotiate these things. I think the way President Trump is handling it right now is completely the wrong way, because it almost seems like he's shooting from the hip. I personally have not seen a plan. I'm not aware of a plan of here's how we're going to integrate tariffs into what we want the economy to look like. It seems like they're almost, you know, we're using as retribution against countries that, that don't want to talk to us. And I think bigger picture from a trade standpoint is we need to get to free and fair trade. And what I mean by that is, is we need to, if we're going to be trading with other countries, they need to have the same environmental rules and they need to have the same wage laws and work rules that we have. 
in order to create a, a, an even playing field. The national debate over gun laws, what changes do we need? Do we need any changes? I think we need lots of changes. I mean, um, we come from a hunting state. There's close to three quarters of a million people that head north every every fall to go hunting. Um, and most mostly people don't hunt with an AR-15 because if you want to keep the meat, you can't use an AR-15. AR-15s are meant to kill. And they're meant to kill and make sure people stay down. Those are guns that people should not have. So the AR-15 is any kind of assault type rifle. And it's really the muzzle compression, the, the exit velocity that we need to look at. Those things should be banned. We need to somehow minimize ammunition. I personally am tired of talking about guns. I think uh, we need to change the conversation to ammunition. We need to talk about how do we restrict ammunition in a way that makes sense for all of us. Because somebody stockpiling tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition doesn't make any sense for the rest of us. And it, to me, it's a sign of a mental health issue. If you think that you need that ammunition to protect yourself in some way, shape, or form. And if you go get Sudafed, you're going to need an ID to go get a box of Sudafed. And if you want more than one box, your name's going on a list. I think we need to start treating ammunition that way. The international debate over climate change. Climate, how real is climate change? Some believe it's overstated. I spent four years on a nuclear submarine. I, I was trained to run a nuclear reactor. Science is not something we need to believe in. Science is real. Um, it's peer reviewed. Climate change is happening. And the longer we wait to do anything about it, I mean, I just read an article this week. We're already past the tipping point. All right, We already know the seas are going to rise. And there are plans in place. Every coastal city in the world already has a plan of what they're going to do. What they lack is funding. And we need to make sure that we have a plan in place to properly fund all these different plans in order to get to where we need to go. But we need to move to alternative energy as quickly as possible. And the people with the money are fighting that every step of the way. So you were in the sub when you were in the Navy? In the Navy, yep. The Trump administration budget calls for a significant increase, I believe, uh, for the Pentagon, more than $700 billion a year. Is it time to dramatically increase Pentagon spending? I think we need to go exactly the other way. Um, you know, we continue, we continue to talk about we don't have enough money for infrastructure, yet we continue to spend on our military, which to me is our biggest jobs program in the world. Uh, but we don't produce tangible things that benefit society. We produce cruise missiles, we produce more submarines, we produce air, uh, planes, ships, you name it. But those things don't create a tangible benefit to us as a society. We need to take some of that money and move it into long-term infrastructure needs. Because the wars that we're going to fight next are not the wars that we fought in the past. There's a war going on right now. It's called cyber warfare, and we're ill-equipped to handle that war, yet we keep investing in things for the perceived next military war. So we should cut the Pentagon budget? I think we need to cut back to where we were before, but we also need a longer-term plan. And one of the reasons I'm running is, is this country lacks a vision and it lacks a plan of where it wants to go. You know, it, you know, since we defeated the Soviets, we've sort of been spinning our wheels, so to speak, with the idea of where are we really going as a country. I think we know what we're about from a core values perspective, but we don't have a vision or a plan of where we want to go next. And it's one of the reasons I want to I want to get into office is because we need people to take a step back from the short term and say where do we want to go long term. And it's the way I it's the way I teach my clients because I'm a business coach, and it's also what I do for my own business. Is if you don't know where you're going, you have no idea what you're going to do next. Some Democratic members of the House uh, say it's time to consider impeachment of the president. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think it's way too soon to be talking about impeachment. I think we need to let the Miller investigation run its course. We need to find out what really happened. And I'm confident that that will wrap up sometime this year. And I think once we have that report and once we know where we're going, I think then we'll know exactly what to do next. But I think it's way too early to talk about impeachment. Let's go back to health care. Medicare is scheduled to exhaust its reserves by mm -hmm. 2026. Your solution for that? Well, I think going to a single payer system. I mean, the biggest threat to our economy right now is health care costs. And right now, there's nobody responsible for bringing down health care costs. And they continue to outpace inflation every single year. I mean, it's gone down from 10 plus percent increases per year, but still a 4 to 5 percent increase per year when we're in a 2 to 3 percent inflationary environment is a drag on the economy. So, Medicare is just one component of that overall health care picture. And Social Security projects it to be technically bankrupt by 2034. What changes would you make to keep it solvent? Well, I, I think part of it is, is we have to, one, raise the cap on Social Security tax. Um, I, I think that cap has been in there too long. I know it's been going up over time, but I think we need to start raising that higher because we made a commitment to Americans that you're never going to die in poverty when you're older. And right now, if we don't keep that commitment, we're, we're leaving you know, millions of people behind. 
when we move from a pension system to a 401k, because we lack financial literacy in this country, we're now having so many people who are not who are ill prepared to be able to retire or move on to uh, the next stage of their life. And and you know this, we're getting older, and we're living longer. And those things in combination, we need to we need to create a system that can handle all the needs of our society. In the last few years, the deficit has grown from two twenty one trillion dollars. Uh, even Senator Ron Johnson, who was elected, saying, I'm going to fight the deficit, is throwing up his hands. Um, how significant a problem, and how do we bring it down? Or, or is Congress incapable? Is Washington not capable of bringing it down? Well, and, and, and I chuckle because this is one of those issues to me that we know how to solve. Um, yet if I'm a politician and want to get elected, it's easy for me to run and tell people I'm going to lower their taxes. But we all know that that just doesn't work. We've made commitments to pay for things, and we we fail to make those we fail to meet those commitments, which means we continue to borrow more money. Jim Sensenbrenner, who's my opponent, has won awards for being a deficit hawk. That deficit, the debt, has gone from 900 billion to 21 trillion in the time he's been in office. In what way does that win you awards? That's what I don't understand. And every time the economy gets going and starts to really move, we cut taxes. And to me, that's the time that we should be balancing the budget because we need to run an unbalanced budget because we know spending outstrips um, revenue in a recession. So we need to have a, a, a rainy day fund, so to speak, but we never get to that point. And one of the most frustrating things since the Reagan era is every time a Republican president is in his office, the debt and the deficit go up, and every time there's a Democrat in office, the trend is always down. So tell me who are the fiscal conservatives in this country? So you would not have voted for the tax package that was Absolutely about. not. Um, because one, we already have low unemployment. So jobs isn't the problem. I said before, wages is the problem. Right now we're doing nothing to increase wages. We're increasing jobs. And if I have two jobs and I'm not making it, a third job is not what I'm looking for. I need wage growth. Because we need to pay people living wage so they can raise a family on one job, not two jobs or three jobs. The civility or lack of it that's now part of our political discourse, what's your thought on that? Uh, how potentially damaging is it? And how would you work to ensure that you're not part of its worsening? Yeah, and this is one of those false equivalencies that it happens in our country. You know, I think Obama was rated, you know, the biggest lie one year because he said you'll still be able to have your doctor when the Affordable Care Act was rolled out. And that wasn't true. He made one lie. Our president lies on average six times a day. We're in an environment where we've never been before, and when we talk about civility, it needs to start from the top. And our president is not a civil person. And to expect civility in an environment that's driven by someone who isn't, I think is a tough sell. When people want to discriminate against people and then they're discriminated against and they cry foul, that to me is just plain wrong. I think we, the people, because we lack the power in certain instances, need to stand up for what's right. And if it means being at least looking uncivil, I mean, the woman that kicked out Sarah Sanders from her restaurant did it in a completely civil manner. And that, to me, is one of those things I look at when we take a step back. That should be protected, and it is. She has the right to refuse service. But when people are refused service who are on record as refusing service to other people and they cry foul, we don't talk about hypocrisy, and that's what we need to talk more about. Uh, you mentioned that Congressman Sensenbrenner has been in a long time. He mm -hmm. has a pretty sizable campaign war chest. Mm -hmm. What's your philosophy on campaign financing? How are you going to be competitive? Yeah, um, you know, we're raising as much as we can. Uh, this is one of those races where everybody has always said, Tom, good luck. Um, you know, we've been able to get out. We've done close to 135 events since September and really gotten out and talked to people and they're energized and we feel like, okay, we've got Democrats because Waukesha County in Wisconsin has the third most number of Democrats of any county in the state. So we've got enough Democrats we can lean on. We're really going after independence at this point. And like I say, you know, Jim Sensenbrenner was my congressman when I turned 18 and I'm 55 and he's still my congressman. Uh, there's something wrong with that. You know, we need new blood on a regular basis in Washington to have new ideas and talk about where we're going, not where we've been. You were on a nuclear submarine. How do you feel when the president meets with the uh, leader of uh, North Korea? Are you optimistic that it could lead to the denuclearization -nuc of North Korea? I think anything that leads to peace is a good thing. 
Um, yet most of the policies that our president has been pushing do not lead toward, at least in, in my mind, a path toward peace around the world. We're creating, we're creating more enemies. How do you create an enemy out of Canada is what I think about. You know, we've all met Canadians. They're the nicest people in the world. Yet somehow we're battling Canada at this point and we're rewarding a regime that is on record of having murdered their citizens in order to stay in power. And we've got a president who is idealistically in sync with that. And that's something I don't think that makes a lot of sense for our country. Do you see your Democratic Party as unified or just almost as split as the other party? I, I think we are. Um, and one of the things, because I've been working up and down the ballot, so I've been working with Tammy Baldwin's campaign. I've met all the different uh, candidates for governor and lieutenant governor. I met Josh Call who's running for attorney general. And then we've been working down the ballot. We've got state assembly races. We've got a state senate seat who we're actually co officing with Julie Henzies running a great race. We talk about exactly the same things. We talk about healthcare, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about climate change, and we talk about education. Because those are the main things that Democrats care about. But more importantly, we talk about fairness. And fairness in justice, fairness in wages, fairness in the ability to live your life, and then equality. Equality should not be something we have to continue to fight for. At some point in our society, in, in the human race, just is, needs to make a decision that we are equal. Part of the debate in Washington among U.S. House Democrats is whether it's time for a new leader. If you go to Washington, would you vote for uh, Nancy Pelosi for a speaker? Yeah, I don't know who I would vote for because we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, I think it's important that whoever is looks like the best leader at that point is someone I'll vote for. Um, Nancy Pelosi, I think, has been a, a, a true warrior and champion for the party. Um, we are at a point, though, where I think we need different blood at some point. I think we need new leadership. It's one of the reasons I'm going. I think we need to elect people that um, are looking at how do, we, how do we create a way to start working more together. Unfortunately for Nancy, the other party has painted her as somebody that we need to vilify. So therefore, she is polarizing. And it's really hard to move forward when we have people that are polarizing, even though it's no fault of her own. Going back to the debate among Democrats nationally, do you consider yourself part of what used to be, and 2016 was the Bernie Sanders wing? Um, not really. I, I, I like a lot of what Bernie's talking about. One of the things, though, I think that he doesn't necessarily make it clear is how we're going to pay for everything. You know, and I think that's important. When I, heard, when I hear the word free, I recoil because nothing's free. Yet I think, I go back to this and I say this all the time, we are the richest country on the planet. Yet we continue to act like one of the poorest countries on the planet. We need to be investing in, in, in all the things that make this country much better than where it was. And I'm not going to say great because we're always on this path to make America greater because that's what we're all about. But there are powerful forces that want us to believe there's not enough money to do the things that we need to do. Is there enough money? How would you raise money to fix highways, bridges, ports, airports? Raise the taxes on the wealthy. I mean, I'm reading a book and, right now. And you're defining wealthy as what? Uh, the top 1%. I mean, we can start there. I'm reading this book right now. It's called When America Worked. <laughs> and it's about the era of Truman and Eisenhower. And the top 5% of wage earners in 1950 made 17% of the economy. And now we're at a point where the top 1%, can, you know, they, they, they got 82% of the world's wealth last year. That kind of income inequality is unsustainable, and we know it. Should there be a rule or a law that uh, a CEO should, shouldn't should make more than X times that? And I'm not in favor of that because I think that's putting some kind of wage or price control on the company. So I think what we need to do is we need to educate enough people. I, I believe in lifting the bottom up. Um, I believe in the idea of abundance. There's more than enough for everybody. It's not a game of you get more and I get less. There's more and more and more. It's unlocking that potential, though, is where we need to go. So I'm not in favor of capping it. I would like to see shareholders be able to have a larger voice in what's going on. Because right now, corporate pay is run by, well, you got more, so I should get more, and you get more, and I get more. And to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because I've met a lot of CEOs, and they're brilliant people, yet are they worth 200, 300, 500 times more than somebody who's just starting out? The Trump administration wants to dismantle the Consumer Finance Agency. It's mm -hmm. new. Uh, your feelings on, on that? Well, I was in banking for 15 years, and I spent five years as the treasurer of U.S. Bank's mortgage company. And one of the things we lack is good financial education in this country. Um, but the other is, is there are powerful forces that want to create usury, which is I want to keep you borrowing at the highest rate possible and then make sure you can pay back enough so I can lend you more. That's, that, to me, is just plain wrong. 
We need to get to the point where people have access to what I call financial leverage to be able to grow and build their lives. Access to affordable mortgages, access to money to be able to buy a car, or whatever else you need, because it's very hard to build a life out of not much. Now, luckily, um, when I went back to school after I was in the Navy, I went under the GI Bill and I was able to get my degree without debt, and then I was able to buy my first home with no money down. You know, and of course I pay back my loans and most people want to pay back their loans. But this is also tied to wage growth. When there's not wage growth, people are barely making it. And if they have a hiccup in their lives, they, do, they have to go to a payday loan or something else just to keep going. And that locks them into this area where powerful forces want to keep them there. What federal action, if any, should Congress, should, should Washington take on the issue of student debt and student loans? Well, one, I think it needs to be refinanceable. Um, but, but the other is, and I learned this when I was in banking, is that Congress sets the rate for student loans. It's not set by the market. And that rate has always been higher than market rates, and it's very hard to get out of it if you, you can't declare bankruptcy, as I understand. And there's, there's a number of things that you can't discharge your student loan debt for. One, I think we need to make it refinanceable. But two, the cost of education is just continuing to go up, and most of that is going back to health care. Because education is a people-based system. And when healthcare goes up, you have to charge more in order to cover what you're working on. So we gotta, we gotta fix healthcare also, and that'll bring down the cost of student loans. But also, we need to be, get back to reinvesting in education. You know, when I was young, when I first went to Madison in 1980, I worked a summer job and I wrote the check for tuition out of my checkbook. And I paid for that first semester of living out of my checkbook. You cannot do that today physically impossible to do. Last question. Contrast um, you with the incumbent, Congressman Sensenbrenner. Um, one is I'm a little bit younger. So um, not that that makes a difference, but I personally believe that as a Democrat and where we're going, I believe we're the party of the future. We're looking at here are the changes we see coming in the world, and we need to be thinking about what policies and what rules and what tax laws we want to put in place for the future, not what has happened. If you talk to Mr. Sensenbrenner, most of his ideas are from the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s. There's not much going on today. In fact, I don't think he knows how to use a computer. Which, uh, and he's on record as saying that people don't need the internet. It's not necessary. So he really doesn't understand where we're going as a society and the things that we're going to need in the future. And plus, I just think we need new blood. I mean, 40 years, in my mind, is enough. If you haven't done what you wanted to do in 40 years, two more years is not going to make it happen. Thank you. Tom Pauzowitz of Brookfield is a Democratic candidate in the 5th Congressional District. The general election is November 6th. Tom, thanks for talking to Wisconsin Eye. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.